It's Sunday morning, and we are preaching on predestination. When the Bible says, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated, before either one were born, before either one had done any good or evil, while they were still in the womb of their mother, Rebecca, there in Romans 9, 11 through 13, when God says, Jacob have I loved, it has an exact meaning. And I like to put this on the board as often as I can. Jacob have I loved before he was born, before born, before he had done any good or evil. Done good or evil. If it's before he was born, while he was still in the womb, that's an amazing thing to me. And Esau have I hated before he was born, before he had done any good or evil. That's before they had even come into the world, and before they had, had existed, God says, I loved one and I hated the other. Of course, we always go back to definition of words. The definition for Jacob would be Israel, because God says, God sends an angel to Jacob and says, what is your name? He said, my name is Jacob, or Yaqab is the way it's pronounced in the Hebrew, and he said, you'll no longer be called Jacob. You will be called Israel. And Israel was God's people. Jacob had 12 sons, starting with Reuben, and then Simeon, and Levi, and down to Judah, and then uh, Gad, and Asher, and Naphtali, and, and uh, all these guys right here. Dan, and Simeon, and, and Judah, and Reuben, and Gad, and Manasseh. And all these were sons of Jacob. Of course, Manasseh and Ephraim were sons of Joseph, his 11th born son. But they, God split the tribe and gave them a tribe and didn't count Levi in Israel. All the way down to Joseph and to Benjamin, the last son. So this became the nation of Israel, who was Jacob. So the Bible says, actually says, Israel have I loved. And I didn't love Esau. Esau's descendants, when you look at Israel, Israel's on the, on the eastern end of the Mediterranean. And this is Turkey up here, and then you got Greece over here, here in the, in the Aegean Sea here, and you got over here, you got Rome, and then you get over here to Spain, you have the Strait of Gibraltar, and you got the Atlantic Ocean over there. And then you got the Mediterranean Sea right here. And God says, I loved Israel, and I didn't love Esau. All the descendants of Esau were just south of Israel. They were called Edomites. Edom. Edom. So he says, I've loved Israel, and I've hated Edom. Edom is right down here. They have their capital city is a place called Petra. And he says, I don't love Syria, and I don't love Babylon, and I don't love Egypt, but I do love Israel. Now, in the New Testament, we are spiritual Israel. And here's the whole point. Loved. What does that mean? Well, you got agape. Two words for love. You have agape and phileo. Phileo means to have affection or to like. Affection or to like something or somebody. I like God. I like my wife. I like my car. I like my dog. I like drugs. That's what the drug head says. I like to get drunk, says the alcoholic. He likes, everybody has a phileo for something. I like my flesh. But agape has to do with Walk in a commandment. Walk in commandment. And 
that was the relationship that fathers had for the sons, that kings had for their subjects. subjects. And that word agape is the word, Israel have I loved, and love is walking in the commandments of God. Well, let me ask you something. On this map right here, here's the Mediterranean Sea, there's Egypt, here's Lebanon, here's ancient Tyre and Sidon. Who got the commandments of God of everybody on that map? Israel got the commandments of God. That's why he says, Jacob or Israel, have I given my commandments to? So when you see love, think given commandments, right? So Israel have I given my commandments to, and everyone that I haven't given my commandments to, I hate them, and they're called vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. They're called natural brute beasts made to be taken and destroyed, and we are spiritual Israel. We're circumcised of the heart, aren't we? We're new creatures, and the Bible says in the 6th chapter of Galatians, this is God's Israel. Now, predestination, when the Bible says, for God so loved the world, it doesn't say God loved everybody in the world. It says God so loved, that's the same word, Israel have I loved, God, in this fashion, gave his commandments. Everywhere you see agape, just think, give commandments of God to them. So he says, God, in this fashion, loved the world. When you see so being an adverb, telling how, when, where, and sometimes why, that, that modifies the verb... They All adverbs modify verbs, adjectives, and other adverbs. Well, this word so modifies love. To modify means to alter. It alters the word love. It conditions the words loved. To who? To Israel, who he loved. And he doesn't love anybody else because we are spiritual Israel, the church. The only person God loves in the world is Israel. That's it. If he, gave, if he loved us, he must have written his commandments somewhere, didn't he? And given them to us. Where did he write his commandments? On fleshy tables of our hearts, did he? He wrote it on tables of stone and gave it to literal Israel over here. Now he's given us his commandments. And predestination is about what God has done. God had a family that he foreknew. Who was his family that he knew in his mind before the world began? It was Israel, wasn't it? That who it was? That's who he's going to give his commandments to? He didn't give his commandments to anybody in the Old Testament, but Israel, did he? I'm being very elementary. I hope you can see that. He didn't give his commandments to no one but Israel. So if he didn't, he said, I scourge. Everyone that I love in Hebrews 12, look at that. Look at Hebrews 12. And keep thinking, agape has to do with having the commandments of God. Hebrews, the 12th chapter. Hebrews 12. Now he says here, in verse... Six, for whom the Lord loveth. And that word loveth is, it's the verb form of agape. Jacob have I loved, God so loved the world. And the verb form is A-G-A-P-E-O. In the Greek you have a noun, agape, and the verb form. You've got that in many words. Well, he says, whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourges every son he receives. He scourges every son he accepts. That word receive, decomai. Decomai is this word receive. Now sometimes you'll have the word receive, and it's not that word, but in this, don't think every time you find the word receive, it's the word decomai. That's why you need to look up the word in your concordance and find out what word it is. Well, 
the Bible says here, he scourges every son he receives. Receive, of course. Dekomai comes from the word dek. That's a, dek is a Greek word. It's the word ten. Decade, ten years. Decalogue. It comes from, comes from deck and logos. Decalogue means the Ten Commandments of God. We call, that's what we call the Ten Commandments, Decalogue. Decomai has to do with ten. It means the ten fingers. It means to reach out the ten fingers and to accept or permit something to come in, to accept. Well, the Bible says God has to accept us. He says he scourges every son. He accepts. Therefore, we cannot accept him. The Bible says that in 1 Corinthians 2.14. The natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. Natural, P-S-U. C-H-I-K-O-S. That would be equivalent to our word physical. Sukikos. That's the word natural. 1 Corinthians 2.14. 1 Corinthians 2.14. That's the word natural. It means the sensual man. Now someone who is sensual, they exercise the senses. The senses. What are the senses? Well, you smell, you hear, you see, you taste, you touch. Those are the five senses. What does that? The physical body. So he says, this body that we live in does not accept anything spiritual. You cannot accept Christ when you're sin. Because there's none that seeks after God. Nobody seeks God. Therefore, he must accept us. And if there's none righteous and none seeks after God, therefore, if he doesn't come and get himself a family, which is Jacob, which is Israel, and if he doesn't put commandments in our hearts, you're not ever going to do right ever nobody will do right you mean my sweet little mother you mean betty down here this sweet little lady down here won't do right she won't do one thing right she is an out and out sinner she may be 88 but i know what she was when she was young you know why i know because i know what i am i know what i was i know what judy was i know what Dwayne was i know what ken was i know what we all are because we're all made of the same stuff there's none that comes to seek God. Therefore, nobody can accept him or pray a prayer. You're not going to pray to a God you don't believe in, are you? Belief is the method of salvation, but you can't even do that if God doesn't put the belief in your heart. When he writes on fleshy tables of our hearts, he places the belief and the conviction there. God's got a family that he foreknew. Foreknow. That's predestination. It's about God knowing Jacob, which is Israel, which in the New Testament, it's us, the church, it's his sons, it's the believers that believe in the law of God that God has written upon our hearts, and that's agape. He has shed abroad his love, there in Romans, the fifth chapter, he shed abroad his love in our hearts. Let's read the rest of this. If you endure chastening, God is dealing with you as with a son. Oh, well, he only loves his children, isn't that right? He just loves Jacob. So if you're a son of God, you're a brother of Christ. Jesus said, my brothers and sisters are those who do the will of the Father and the will of the Father is agape that's been shed abroad in our hearts. That is the will of God that we do His commandments. 
But since there's nothing good in us, he has to spank us and scourge us and beat us over the years and cause us to be willing to be obedient to him. Now, I know there's people here. I'm going to tell off on you without telling who you are because sometimes I don't know who you are. But there's people here. That... Oops, you mean people at grace and truth cuss. Now, those of you, get your head back up. Don't drop your head. There's people here that do things they shouldn't do. If you belong to God, don't make excuse for it. And don't call it French. It's not French. I was riding down the road with a lady one day. And her husband was a friend of mine. And he had come to the Bible class. And she said, excuse my French. And she let out some cuss word. I said, first of all, I'm not going to excuse you. You have to ask God to do that. And that's not French. Next time somebody says that, say, that's not French. Now, the ones that God loves is his family, and he foreknew them. Foreknow is the word prognosco. Prognosco means to know intimately. Like when you're walking down the street and you see somebody walking, you say, hey, I know that guy. That means you've had some kind of relationship with him, and he's an acquaintance of yours or a friend of yours. That's why the Bible says, to Jeremiah. Jeremiah, before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. He didn't say, Jeremiah, I knew about thee. He said, I knew you. There in Jeremiah 1 5. I had an intimate relationship with you before I did the forming in the belly. I know your parents think they formed you. But if I've chosen you before the foundation of the world, when that sperm comes in contact with the egg it's not the first sperm that hits the egg that fertilizes the egg it might be the 17th sperm that hits the egg and if it's any other sperm any other egg it'll be a completely different individual so god has to stir the passions in a husband and wife to come together and to have a baby and she has to be ovulating the exact right time and it has to be an exact seed or exact sperm. Otherwise, it won't be that person. So God said, I did the forming in the belly. I knew you and ordained you a prophet to the nations. So God knew Jeremiah, and Jeremiah was in Israel, wasn't he? And he writes in Jeremiah's heart these things. So foreknow has to do with knowing Israel before the foundation of the world, God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation and he loved Israel and he wrote upon our hearts and we're spiritual Israel and he wrote upon Jacob's heart and he put it in his son's heart and they began to have all these children and they became the nation of Israel and that's where they got the law or what they called the Torah. And what they call Torah we call Pentateuch. Pentateuch is the, Pent means five, Pentateuch is the first five books of the Bible. And when you hear the Jews talk about Torah, they're talking about Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. That's Torah. That's Pentateuch. First five books. That's what's called the law. The law. And that's written in our hearts, isn't it? Now, God foreknew his family. Right? Jacob. He loved them. He so loved the world because he limited his love to Jacob. So alters loved in John 3.16. He limits his love to his family who he foreknew. Foreknow means to know intimately beforehand. That's what pro means. Pro is our prefix pre. So he pre-knew us before we were ever born. He said before... Jacob and Esau were born. He said, I loved Jacob, my son Israel. I'm going to give him my commandments, and I will give Esau none of my commandments. That's what it means. Now, so this is what the Bible's talking about, whom he did foreknow. It's talking about Jacob or Israel he foreknew. And Israel is always spiritual, and it's the church. Church is the word ecclesia. 
So when we're talking about predestination, we're talking about God's foreknown family. That's about as simple as I can put it, folks. And that seems quite elementary to most people coming here. That's why the Bible says, For whom he did foreknow, Romans 8, 29. For whom he did foreknow. He also did predestinate. His foreknown family was his prognosco family. Let me put it down here. Prognosco. That's the word. It means to know intimately beforehand. The people, the whom's, not the what's. What if I said for the Israel? Because they are a whom, aren't they? Who's? Who's is the word whom? Masculine gender. That's God's people that he foreknew. So for the Israel that God foreknew, he has predestined pro horizo. There's the word predestinate. He has before, just like he before knew them, he had prognosco, he has pro horizo, the ones that he pro gnosco. Pro horizo means to pro pre horizo. Pre means before, so he knew us before the foundation of the world. He hath chosen us. Spiritual Israel, spiritual Jacob, in him before the foundation of the world. He has chosen us from the beginning. We are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit. There's a method of salvation. It's being sanctified. through sanctification of the Spirit and believing the truth. Belief of truth. Now this is the way God has determined about what He has predestined. Pro horizo, pre horizo. Horizo means to bound. But horizo is our word horizon. It means to bound inside the light. And the light is where the, the light is the horizon. The horizon is where the light shines. And then there's darkness. And he's called us from darkness to light. He says, you were darkness, now you light. Now you horizo in the Lord. Walk as children of light. And the whole purpose of predestination is because God made every one of us in fleshly bodies where we couldn't do right when we come to the knowledge of good and evil. We will not do right. Everybody here is wrestling with sin, aren't you? Everybody. Sometimes you're wrestling with your mouth. Sometimes you're wrestling with anger and rage. You're Some here are wrestling with being mad all the time. Some are wrestling with getting their feelings hurt all the time. And do you know that getting your feelings hurt and wearing your, and wearing your feelings on your sleeve is the same thing as being a superstar on stage? Did you know that? It's the same thing as being one of these rock stars getting your feelings hurt. You know why? Because you're looking for attention. We're not supposed to be feeling sorry for ourselves. So when we're into self, we're just into our sin. So God has to, what he's going to do, let's continue reading this here. He said he scourges every son he receives. If you endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? He's saying, you're not my son if I don't chasten you because the ones I love, the ones I agape or agapao, those are the ones I chasten. So if you don't get the chastening of God, 
He says, I do not love you. I have not written my law in your hearts and you don't have any conviction. That's why when people want to fight you over predestination, don't argue with them. They don't have the law written in their hearts and that's God's arbitrary choice, isn't it? Then why are we fighting with them? If God doesn't love them and he hasn't written the law in their hearts, why are you trying to get them to do right? They can't do right. You can be grieved and go, oh me. And then all of a sudden you realize that God has chosen you and that will put you on your face one night when you're at home thinking about it. You're going, oh me. Oh, God chose me. And he could have chose them instead of me and you'll get face down. Has anybody ever done that and it scared the life out of you because you realized this is simply God's choice that you believe the truth and only few out of the world will believe the truth and you're one of those few? That's a very sobering thought, isn't it? I'm one of these few. Lord, there's 7 billion people in the world. And if there's 100, if there was 100 million, that would be less than a, that would be a drop. If there was 100 million people, if everyone in America was a believer, that would be about 4.5% of the world's entire population. Do you actually believe everybody in America is a believer? No. Do you believe all these Baptists and Church of Christ and Pentecostals are all believers? I don't believe that. I don't believe that at all because if they were believers, they wouldn't fight predestination. They wouldn't fight the election of God. They wouldn't fight you over Christmas. They wouldn't fight you over free will or the will of God or the sovereignty of God. People who believe God do not have to be convinced of it. Do they? You don't have to convince a person of truth. If they've got it written in their hearts, they will believe. They might not get a hold of it today, but they'll start wrestling with it as soon as you tell them about it. And they'll start resolving this thing. Don't argue with somebody and try to convince them of truth. It's either in their hearts or it is not. They're either elect or they're not. They're either, either a vessel of mercy or they are a vessel of wrath fitted to destruction. Well, they can't be a vessel of wrath. I love them so much. No, you lust them so much. Okay? Lust is not love. Old people, is it? Is it? It's not it's not love. I want her. I want him. Well, that's just lust. Wait till you get her. Wait till you get him. Wait till the fight starts. We don't like that grace and truth. Had a, had a fellow coming here, and he said, I'm going to marry that woman I met down there in Charleston, South Carolina. I said, but she don't believe truth. I'll convince her after we're married. So she came up here and she come to church with him. And one night she kept saying to me, Jim, I'm really beginning to see predestination. I'm really starting to see it and I can really understand it. And she was so soft-spoken and she had that sincere dying calf look in her eye. I, I just <laughs> love this truth. And she just was, and they got married. They didn't have me marry. The next week, I called her and I said, is your husband there? Uh, we found another church we're going to. We don't need you in our life anymore, click. It was the end of it. It's the last I saw him. She was, and it's the last I saw him. And that was 10 years ago. Let me tell you, don't ever tie up with unbelief. Let's read the rest of this. If you endure chastening, God is dealing with you as with a son. He only chastens those he loves, those that he's given his commandments. If God's given the commandments and written it in somebody's heart, you don't have to convince them. How many people here try to argue with people about... Come on, some of you be honest. Stop that. If they're elect, they'll hear, won't they? We're elected to obey God there in 1 Peter 1 and 2. We're elected to obedience. And we will. God may have to beat us, but we will. For what son is he whom the Father chastens not? 
But if you be without chastisement, what he said, he chastens every son he loves. Didn't he say that? Therefore, he says, if you be without chastisement, whereof all of God's children are partakers. That's what he's saying. All are partakers, all of his children. Then you're a bastard and no son of mine and I don't love you. Isn't that what he's saying? Now that's pretty heavy right there. If he don't chasten you to cause you to be willing to be obedient and serve him, he does not love a person like that. If he loves some, it's not God is love and he loves everybody. He loves human flesh. He does not. Would you ever come up with that? And he says, furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh. Hollis Brown was my father, which corrected us. And we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subject unto the father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chastened us after their pleasure. Sometimes my father chastened me and it wasn't my fault. Believe me, it was Clyde's fault. <laughs> <laughs> Clyde would beat me up. He was a lot bigger than me. And then daddy would come in and say, You always behave yourself. And he'd grab both of us up by the arm and spank us in. That's really embarrassing to have your feet that far off the floor while he's holding you up, beating you. Clyde would beat me, and then Daddy would come and beat both of us. I'm thinking, this is not fair. <laughs> and it, well, it wasn't. Now, yeah, I was always about half his size. He didn't let nobody, Clyde wouldn't let nobody else beat me up. He'd go fight my battles. Now, he says, For they verily for a few days have chastened us after their own pleasure. But God, for our profit, that we might be partaker of his holiness he chastened us so there you are he chastens us he scourges us scourge is the word mastix m-a-s-t-i-x it comes from the word mastigao this is the word scourge scourge the verb this is the word scourge the noun. You see, a scourge was a, a whip. It was a little, had a little short handle. This is what they beat Jesus with. And it had leather thongs and it had pieces of glass and bone all through it. And when you were beaten, it was a bloody beating. God says, I beat my children. And I'm going to beat sin out of you. And this is going to be persecution. It's going to be suffering. It's going to be tribulation. It's going to be the world hating us. If the world hated me, it'll hate you. world hating us. And the whole purpose of this scourge is that we might be partakers of his holiest, holiness. H-A-G-I-A-S-M-O-S is the word holiness. And one of the words for sanctify is the word hagiazo, H-A-G-I-A-Z-O. And that is the word sanctify, which is just a form of holiness. Sanctify. And then you have, that's also the word hallowed, hallowed or sanctified. When we say, Lord, hallowed be thy name, we're saying, Lord, get rid of my name, my, my onoma, my authority. Get rid of my opinion, which is my law, my opinion, my imagination. Anytime a man has an opinion... He has an imagination, doesn't he? And he says, we have to be sanctified to be partakers of his holiness. And hagios is the word holy. It means to be pure. This is the word holy. So all of these are forms of the word holy. Pure or single. As in one substance in our lives. 
So what? how do we get rid of all this foreign substance in our lives? Through fire, trial, persecution, tribulation, and the list goes on and on. We must through much tribulation enter the kingdom of God. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. We're going to be persecuted by people for believing in predestination, for believing in something that is as elementary as love, is walking the commandments of God. This is love, that we walk after His commandments, Second John 6. This is agape, Second John 6. This is agape. So when God so loved the world that we walk after His commandments, walk after commandments, so if that is agape, if God so loved, or if he loved Jacob, that's his family, that's the whom's that he foreknew, and he's predestined us to be conformed. To be conformed, sumorphos. S-U-M-M-O-R-P-H-O-S. We're going to be conformed, shaped in fellowship. The more you fellowship with true believers, not going to a Baptist church or a Church of Christ or Pentecostal church, the more you fellowship with God's people, the more you are shaped into the likeness of Jesus, into the icon. We have been predestined to be conformed to His likeness, and that's going to be through sanctification. He's going to cause us to be holy when He puts, out, puts us in the fire, and He burns out all those impurities in us. When you put gold ore in a fire and you turn the heat up, and the higher you turn it, the heat in a furnace, the metallurgists, people who work in metals, will tell you that the foreign substances burn out. And the other metals will burn out. Nickel will burn out. Uh, zinc will burn out. Silver will be one of the last things to burn out. And what's left is the gold. And gold will never scorch. You can turn the heat to the high heavens. And it won't scorch. It won't burn. It just becomes more and more pure. And it becomes a liquid that you can pour it into a mold and it'll take the form of the mold or it'll take the form of the shape. And we're predestined to conform to the fire, to the tribulation, we're going to be shaped together in the likeness, in the image of Christ. That's what predestination's about. It's about a family that God knew. And that's his Israel, Jacob. And God so, or in this fashion, loved the orderly arrangement of mankind that the believing all. Whosoever is not in that text, forget that word. It's the believing all. There is one particular the Believing all. And they took that, that word, the believing all, in the Greek text, the, it's a form of, uh, excuse me, it's a form of te, believing, P-I-S-T-E-U-O. I don't know if that's an Omicron or, a, or an Omega, but the believing pos. The believing all. The is singular. Believing is singular. Believing is a participle. That is also an adjective, verbal adjective. It's an ing word in English. The is an adjective, it's an article, a definite article. There's one specific believing single all. That is God's people as one whole. That would be Israel, right? That would be the flock. That would be the wife. We're all a part of the wife. We're all a part of the one flock. So God so loved this one believing all. That's what it's talking about. People need to deal with that. That 
not whosoever believeth in him, that thee believing all shall have everlasting life. There's no condition in it. Thee believing all will believe. That's God's Israel, isn't it? And you know how much I can speak of God's Israel? I can stay up here all day long and talk about Ephesians, the second chapter, Colossians, the second chapter, Romans, the second chapter, Galatians, the sixth chapter, and it, in Philippians, the third chapter. It goes on and on. Now, so we're predestined to be conformed, those of us that he loved, which is his Israel, his people, he's predestined us to be like Jesus. And the reason he's predestined us to be like Jesus is because we're not like Jesus, right? We're not, when we're born again, does that have to anything to do with our physical bodies? And when you're 15 or 18 and you're born again, is your flesh born again? No. You got an outer man. Paul says that outer man serves the law of the flesh. And the inner man, which is Christ in you, which is the new birth, which come about by Jesus because he foreknew us, the Bible says, of his own will beget, or birthed he us. We were conceived by God in our hearts, and then he begins to write his law, and we've got all kinds of sin, and, and we've got all kinds of aggravation, and we've got all kinds of anger and rage and contention and strife in us. And he says, I'm going to put you through fire and trial because you're my son, and I knew you before the world had begun. That's why Ephesians 1 and 5 says, we have been adopted by Jesus Christ to himself, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children, by Jesus Christ unto himself according to the good pleasure of his will. So he has adopted us. Adopted. Adoption in Ephesians 1 and 5, having predestinated us unto adoption, unto the adoption of children. Predestination is about being adopted. Well, adopted, that seems like such a difficult word until you define it. Huiothosia. U-I-O-T-H-E-S-I-A. It's got a diacritical mark which has a breathing sound, a huiothosia. And huios is the word sons. Oh, and then tithome, this word huiothosia comes from huios and tithome, T-I-T-H-E-M-I, and tithome means to place. It has various, various kinds of meanings, but in this place it means to place sons. Well, if God has predestinated us unto the adoption of sons, what sons are he's he going to adopt? And what's he going to do to them? His sons are Israel, aren't they? And he is adopting his spiritual Israel because he foreknew us and he's written up on fleshy tables of our hearts of our hearts, and then he's going to put every one of us through fire, trial, until we come to the likeness of Jesus. Isn't that it? This is fairly simple to me. It's the reason people don't believe it is because they got all these opinions, don't they? And he's going to take years to put us through all this, and he's going to cause this old man to die off. The older you get, the longer you live, the more fire you go through, the more you're going to learn the truth. And the more you're going to live in it. So, having predestinated us unto adoption, he places sons. If you go to an orphanage, the kids don't pick you out. You pick them out, don't you? And he's picked his sons. And what does he do to these sons? He scourges us to cause us to be protectors of his holiness. So if you're going through fire and trials, the trial of your faith is more precious than gold that perish, though it be tried by fire. 
count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing that this trying of your faith works patience. Let patience have its perfect work. Don't get bent out of shape about the trials you're going through because when you get old enough, you come to a place of realization. <sighs> Everything I went through made me who I am. You ever think about that? What we are today is a product of everything we've been through. So therefore, if he says in everything give thanks, this is the will of God, it's the will of God because it's making you holy. It's getting rid of your name, your authority, your opinion, your imagination. When man is involved in his imagination, what is he involved in? He's involved in a Babylonish doctrine. Because the Bible says over there in Revelation 17 and 5, Babylon is the mother of all harlots. She mothered all idolatry. Now, I'm not making that up. I'm not making this mean what I want it to mean. Harlotry is the word pornea. We get the word porn from that. When you come up with pornography, it doesn't just mean to look at naked women in a Playboy magazine. That's not what porn means. It doesn't mean to look at naked men in a woman's magazine. It just means to look at something and serve it. It is idolatry. Idolatry is the word E-I-D-O-L-O-L-A-T-R-E-I-A. -E idolatry is the construction of ido and latruo. And how many times have I put this on the board? So many I can't count. But that's very important to understand what idolatry means. It means to serve what you see. To serve what you put into your eyes and your ears. Watch out what you look at. If you look at something long enough and long after it, your body is going to labor to fulfill it. That's what the Bible... It don't matter if it is a man, if it's a woman, if it's a car, if it's a house. Whatever it is where you long for it. What you're doing is getting involved in lust... Lust, epithumia, to long for that which is forbidden. What is forbidden? You mean a woman is forbidden to me if she don't believe the truth? A man is forbidden to me if they don't believe the truth? You mean a new car is forbidden to me? I think new $125,000, $50,000 cars are forbidden to anybody. I mean, how much more could you do with that extra 60 or 80 or hundred thousand dollars go out and buy your new chevrolet i've got to have a, a a good car to get around to do all the ministry work but i don't need a new one every year i drive a 2000 rav 4 that's what i drive i like it runs good why well, don't i want to go spend money on a new car that runs fine gets me back and forth to church to nashville to the doctor i don't care about new cars it was free. huh it was free from mary I take whatever she, I take all of her cast-offs. That's what I drive. Whatever she decides she wants to go get a new car, I say, I'll take that. So that's the way I am. I'm at a place, if you get old enough and live long enough, you don't long for those things. So what you put in your eyes and ears is idolatry. Babylon began, Babylon is the mother. Babylon birthed all idolatry. Babylon Babylon nourished idolatry, fed idolatry, raised it, fed it, made it a God in your life, and the God that it made was self because when you keep serving what you look at and you keep looking at self, I got to have this. I, by the way, the word I is the word E-G-O in the Greek. Ego. E that's what I is. I've said this, made the statement. I saw a special on Eleanor Roosevelt a few years ago. They said she gave an interview for an hour and never mentioned the word 
I to the whole interview. Whew. That'd be hard to do, wouldn't it? Didn't mention I not one time. Now, all right. So if Babylon mothered it all, Babylon founded it on imagination. We, we started this last week. I don't think I've said, Jacob, have I loved any clearer than I said it this morning. I don't think I've ever said, for God so loved any clearer than this morning. This ought to be a real clear message about, for God so loved the orderly arrangement. Cosmos is the word world. It's masculine and gender, but it means an orderly arrangement of man. That's the word world in John 3.16, cosmos. Masculine and gender. It's actually cosmon because it's in the direct object. The word ending is changed depending on what case is in. That's where it is in the sentence. The basic word is cosmos. That's the basic word. So that's why you need an interlinear Bible to find out what the exact spelling is and then look it up in an analytical lexicon. It's masculine and gender. So God so loved the orderly arrangement of mankind is singular that the believing all shall have everlasting life. That's what John 3.16 says in the original. It doesn't say, for God loved everybody in the world that whosoever wants to come. Uh, somebody said last night, well, these free will people believe uh, whoever wants to come can come. Well, that's true in a sort of a way because if you want to come, where are you going to get the want to? It has to come from God, doesn't it? God has to write it in your heart. So if you want to come and believe God, the only way you can, He's already come to you when He calls you to come to Him. When He looked at Matthew, He said, Matthew, you are mine. Follow me. When He said, follow me, the word is akulatheo, A-K-O-U-L-O, L-A-T-H-E-O. Akulatheo means to be in the same way with Jesus, with. And the way is the narrow way. Narrow is the way that leads to life. It is the word hodos. And that means a road, a street, a journey. And akulatheo, follow, is an imperative mood. And you can look that up. You look the word in the interlinear, pull out your parsing guide, your analytical lexicon, look up the word, and it'll tell you it's an imperative mood. That's a command. Some you have to do. So Matthew had no choice. The living God of the universe said, You follow me. He said, Yes, sir. And God put it in his heart to do that. He didn't say, Matthew, would you like to follow me? He commanded him to follow. Now, so, Babylon mothered all opinions, imagination. Babylon mothered our authority. When you have an authority, you have an opinion. That's your vain imagination. That's what it is. God has ordained everything. There's a verse I read last night. Over in Proverbs 16 and 1. I love this. Proverbs 16 and 1. 16 and 1. Just, I want you to think on this for a second. Just think on it for a few, a few seconds. Maybe 10 or 15. The preparations of the heart in man... And the answer of the tongue. Now remember, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. What God has prepared in a man's heart will come out his mouth. If God has prepared good in his heart, it will come out his mouth. If God has prepared evil in his heart and made him a vessel of wrath fitted to destruction, evil will come out. I have condemned People like Kenneth Copeland. Kenneth Copeland is one of the most evil 
wicked, godless men I have ever seen in my life anywhere. He twists God's word and says, God wants you to send him money and he robs the poor and the needy and the downtrodden. People go broke giving those guys money. They're very evil and that's their own imagination that they're involved in. So he says, the preparation of the heart in man and the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. What's going on in your heart and what comes out of your mouth is from God. And when you're involved in sin, you better be praying, God deliver me from my tongue, which is coming from my heart. If you cuss real easy, or if you gossip real easy, or you give people a hard time real easy, and you don't know what you're doing, you better learn to shut your mouth. Say, Lord, teach me to shut my mouth. It's from the Lord. All the ways of a man are clean in his own eyes. But the Lord weigheth the spirits. And he says up here in verse 9, A man's heart deviseth his way, but the Lord directs his step. Man sits around thinking, I'm going to do this, and then I'm going to do that, and I'm going to have this business, and I'm going to get rich, and I'm going to be somebody, and I'm going to do this. And God says, no, you're not. Here's some trial and persecution. Get over here. And he moves you where he wants you to go by, not just by simple thinking, but by persecution and trials and bankruptcies and divorce and everything you can think of. He moves you in the direction he wants you to go. And he'll put you through so many trials Someday you'll think you're going to die. I have been at place say, Lord, I could just die. I can't stand to live any longer. In my mid-40s, I was the most miserable man alive. And now he's made me happy in my 70s. Thank God for that. Now, we're talking about God's predestined to conform to Christ's likeness through fire and trials because we are his Israel and Israel has he loved or given his commandments to. But he gave us his commandments and we've got a man and the outer man that does not want to do the things that God says. We've got an inner man that says, I insist. This is Christ in us, the hope of glory. This is also agape written in our hearts. This is the Holy Spirit in us. And he says, you're going to behave yourself because I've got a lot of fire for you and I've got a lot of trials for you and I know you love this flesh and I know you, since you're a believer, you want to have predestination on the inside, predestination on the inside and you want to have stuff on the outside and you're going to seek self and you're going to live in sin and contention and strife and fussing and arguing and fighting until I teach you over the years and you're not going to live that way. Has anybody had a problem with that besides me? <laughs> Boy, I wanted to live for me. I wanted to be somebody. I wanted to be famous. I actually wanted to be famous and rich. And I was seeking that for years. That's why I'm so happy with this man. I like this man. I don't like the old Jim Brown. Rusty will come up to me sometimes after church. I'll say, I love this Rusty. I don't like the old Rusty. He says, me either. I don't like the old me. He was too hard to get along with. And if you feel that stress and that pressure all the time and you wonder why people are having a hard time getting along with you, God's dealing with you as with sons and he's scourging you so you can partake of his holiness and what he's doing. All that contention and strife and pride and fussing and all of this is that outer man. And God says, I'm going to get rid of that. Get. He's not going to, you're not going to get saved, but you're going to get rid. You're going to get rid of it, and it's going to take a lot of fire. If you don't stop fighting by the time you're in your mid-60s, you're going to die shortly thereafter. You may die shortly before you hit 60. If you don't stop fighting. You know where fight starts? Don't start with the fist. Don't even start with the mouth. It starts with the mind. 
that's where it starts. If next time somebody bothers you and gives you a hard time, say, this is the will of God and this is what God wants for my life. Then you're beginning to learn and partake of his holiness. Everything we go through, you say, but, but they hurt me and they beat me out of money. Well, just back away from them, okay? See, God's teaching you when you hang around people that hurt you, get away from people that hurt you, right? And go fellowship, sumorphos. When he says, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed. He's not only saying fellowship with people of God. He's saying this fellowship with unbelief. Isn't that what he's saying? Quit fellowshipping with people that don't believe God. Quit running with them. Quit going to eat with them, going to bow with them, going to some movie with them, going to wherever you're going with them, and go with a believer. And watch out where you go and what you put in your eyes and your ears. Right? <laughs> we have a hard time with that, don't we? So if Babylon mothered all idolatry, what you put in your eyes and your ears, she, she was founded... Babylon was founded on opinion. And opinion is imagination. That's what the Bible says. Let's go back over there to Genesis, where Babylon began. Genesis 11. I thought I was going to get further in this message. How much time do I have, Mike? All right. Now look here in Genesis 11. So what God is doing... He's known Israel before the foundation of the world. And he only so loved the world because he loved only Israel. That's why he had to alter the word loved. So he loved his Israel, which is the church. Israel was called out of Egypt. Church means called out, ecclesia. And we're called out of this world to live righteously. So he has to scourge us so we can partake of his holiness. Now, in the 11th chapter of Genesis is the beginning of Babylon. This is the first Babylonian dynasty. Nimrod builds Babylon. He starts everything in the Middle East of what we call Iraq. Here's Iraq. There's the boundary of Iraq. That is Babylon of the ancient world. That is the Euphrates River. Here's the Tigris River running through it. They come together in southern Iraq or southern Babylon. And they empty out, those two come together, the, the Tigris and Euphrates, and they empty into the Persian Gulf. Babylon, the city of Babylon was built on the Euphrates River. You've got to remember, you had the Babylonian Empire, and the headquarters of the capital city was in the city of Babylon. So you got two ways to refer to Babylon, the city and the empire. And they were ruling the entire world at that time. Well, this is Babylon. She mothered all idolatry. And you'll find that's the same place you find where the Garden of Eden was when you look at, when you look at the second chapter of Genesis. It talks about the rivers that run together and they're described as being in southern Iraq or Babylon. It's, they're described in the same place. In Genesis, the second chapter, the Garden of Eden was described as being down here in southern Babylon or Iraq. I'll go into that on another day. And that's exactly the boundary of Israel. The, boundary of, the original boundary in the 16th chapter, 15th chapter of Genesis was from the great river of Egypt and to the great river Euphrates. That was originally all of Israel. Now, we're not going to kick out the Saudis and the Jordanians and the Syrians, so that's not going to work. It won't happen. So, so Babylon was founded there. And this is the founding of Babylon. They said, let us build us a city and a tower in verse 4. And let us make us up a name. Let us make us an opinion. The word name is Shem. Shem was God's prophet on the earth. They said, we don't like Shem telling us what to do. We'll make up our own Shem and we will call him the Messiah or he'll be the deliverer 
and among all, and that was where the fire worship began in Babylon. This was the beginning when they said, let us make us up a name. And in that fire worship, they had a virgin mother, a virgin born son. They had a father. They had a trinity. Everything you had in Christianity, they had in Babylon. And they made them, they actually had another Jesus. Hercules or Adonis or whatever cult you went into, they all had a savior. And that's what they called Hercules or that's what they called Attis up in Turkey. A-T-Y-S. What's amazing, Attis, A-T-T-I-S or A-T-Y-S, Attis was the savior of the gods up here in Pergamos. And Attis comes from the word E-T-E-S, and that word Attis is the word tree or stock. When they worshiped a stock, it was tree worship. It's what it was. It was the Christmas tree is what it was. Now, here's what happens when you make up your own doctrine. They said, let us make us a shem. Shem is equal to onoma in the Greek. Onoma is the word name. And shem is the word name in the Hebrew. This is Hebrew. This is Greek. And when we say, Lord, hallowed be thy name, hallowed be your onoma, your authority, We're saying, Lord, get rid of my authority. Get rid of my name. Get rid of me. Lord, may I be hidden in the shadows so that only you can be seen in my life and not my authority. What is my authority? Well, that supercar, that super lake home, all my bank accounts, my money, that's my authority. I'm somebody around here. I'll have a big name in this town. Hallowed be thy name. Holy your name in my life. And the only way you can do it is if you destroy my name. They said, let us make us a name. Let us make up our own authority. We have an opinion. The Bible calls that imagination. Kenneth Copeland has the wildest, vivid imagination. So does T.D. Jakes. They steal from the poor. They cheat from the poor and the needy and the widows and the orphans. I know so many stories on those guys. I can't even begin to tell them how people will give their last nickel. One fellow here in town, I call him DBN. I don't call him TBN. I call him the Devil's Broadcasting Network because that's what they are. Devil, demonion means to distribute fortunes, and that's what they're doing. Talk to a lady up at Gallatin in the antique mall. We got to talking about this so-called Christian network up here. They suck the life out of the poor. They got every kind of technique to make people feel bad. One fellow said he was cleaning the pool of an acquaintance of mine. Me and Mary were taking a walk. And we got to talking to him. He said, my wife used to work up there. And when they're on the phones... And you're calling in for prayer, which they think is wishing. It means to bow to the will of God. Said that they'll say, well, will you send in money? You do this. You send this. Well, I don't have any money. Do you have any heirlooms of your mother and your father? Well, send those in. And this fellow said his wife would be sitting at her her desk in her office and Paul Crouch would come in with a suitcase and he'd open it and dump it on her desk, and it'd be stacks of jewelry, heirlooms, of family heirlooms, and he'd say, sell this. They are heartless. Just have no heart whatsoever. And this one lady said that there was a man here in Hendersonville. They had talked him into giving everything he had. He was old, he was retired, and he gave his house to him. He gave his car to him. People say, if you're that big of a sucker, no. The reason people give everything to these people is because they are ignorant and they're not going to get a hundredfold back. They're not going to get rich by giving them everything. And that's not true. 
and they take some poor, needy, uh, hard-working person like this fellow. They took everything he had, and he started calling his daughter in Michigan. And, she, and he kept saying, I need some help. She said, but Dad, you got your house paid for and your car and you, you got your income coming in. What do you need? He said, you've got to come down here. They had taken everything he had. They wouldn't help him. And he ended up broke in his 70s and he had no money, no way to make a living. If that don't infuriate you, something is wrong. You're sick. It anger it, it it just enrages me when I hear the things that they do. They have made themselves a name and they twist God's word and say, This means God wants you to prosper and be in health. Prosper, you hodos means well way. And Jesus said, I am the hodos. And Health is the word hugiano. It's the same word Paul used when he spoke of sound doctrine. It's not talking about money and physical health. It's talking about the well way, which is Christ, and it's narrow and it's full of tribulation, and that we will be accompanied by the uncorrupt word of God. They rich the word of God and say, see, God wants you rich, but you need to give, send your... If you're going to get, you have to give to, to this con. And that's what it is. They don't say con, but that's what it is. And they take everybody's money and they have made themselves and twisted the doctrine of God and they made themselves a name and that is their opinion and it's an imagination. Look here. Let's continue reading. Verse 6. God said, let's go down in verse 5 to the city and the tower and see what these children of men had done. They're not my children. And he says in verse 6, The Lord said, Behold, the people is one. They have all one language. And this they begin to do. Make themselves an opinion. And now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Once you make yourself an opinion... Your imagination goes wild. And we're not conforming to that, are we? No. In the word imagine, this they begin to do. Now nothing will be restrained from them. It's the word zama. Zama means to just create in your mind. It means just to plan in a bad sense, to plot or think evil devices, devise ways you can get people's stuff, money, houses, things. It's being a crook. Those people are worse than Al Capone. They are worse than the mob. Do you know that Copeland brings in 125 to 35 million a year? Do you know Joyce Myers brings in around 100 million a year? I've checked these people out. Do you know T.D. Jakes? All he has is a bunch of catchphrases. Well, come on. Well, come on. Yeah. Well, come on. Uh, you don't know what I'm talking about. Write that down and tell me how much sense that makes. Come on, come on. You don't know what I'm talking about. Yeah, you can do it. You can do it. What? There's no Bible in it. Creflo Dollar needs to change his name to Trefo Nickel. The guy is a criminal. He owns a shopping center beside his church. He drives a three... at. About five years ago, he was driving a $350,000 uh, Bentley that his people gave to him. He's supposed to be serving them, not them, him. They're crooks. Kenneth Copeland's their daddy. He is the cause of all those guys coming in. He's the indirect cause of T.D. Jakes being there. He is the cause of Rod Parsley coming in. He's the cause of Fred Price coming in. He's the daddy now since Kenneth Hagin died. He's the daddy of the movement. And he's criminal. They belong 
in prison. And you know what? They're going to God's prison one day. It's called hell. Life sentence. Huh? They're going to have a life sentence with no parole. That's right. Now, imagination is nothing but opinion. If you have an opinion, when people say, well, I don't believe that predestination. I go with John 3.16. Then you have to believe in predestination if you go with the original text. Because God so loved, so gave His commandments to the orderly arrangement of mankind that the believing all, there's one particular specific believing all, and that is God's church, His elect family. And we're elected to obedience to God. First Peter 1 and 2. Now, I want us to look at some of these verses on imagination. Look at Genesis 8. Genesis 8. So when a man has an opinion, that's what God is going to pull us out of. Man's opinion is his contention and his strife and his pride and his arrogance that keeps him from serving God. When God says, I predestined my people to conform to the likeness of Christ, I'm going to get rid of your opinion and your imagination. You know what it takes to stand up here and say these words this hard? It takes God dealing with your heart because I wasn't willing to say these words when I was a young preacher in my 20s. God had to put me in a hospital, nearly killed me, put me on IVs. I was in and out of the hospital constantly in my mid-40s. I was sick all the time. I was fighting for breath, running to the hospital in the middle of the night. If you notice, I'm not having that problem now. I wonder why. I was stressed to the hilt. I had an opinion. I'm going to become somebody. I'm going to get rich in real estate. I was going to get rich in the music world. I was, I'm going to do this. I've got to do this. I, I, I've got to do this. Oh, oh. And I had a heart attack and heart surgery. It'll kill you. Self will kill you. But you know what I believed when I was young? I was Superman and nothing could hurt me. <laughs> Watch God hurt you. God won't hurt his people. He'll beat you half to death. What are you talking about? God's not a cosmic police officer walking up down the corridors of heaven uh, trying to get people. He certainly is. Where'd you come up? Who come up with that kind of idea? God's not a cosmic police officer. No, he's a cosmic God demanding his people to conform. Now look over here in Genesis 8. Just give you a few of these. Genesis 8, verse 21. He's talking about how evil men's hearts and what makes their heart evil. 8. 21. Y'all have already read it and I'm trying to turn to it. And the Lord smelled a sweet savor when Noah built an altar in the previous verse and took every clean beast and every clean fowl in verse 20 and offered burnt offerings in the, upon an altar. And the Lord smelled a sweet savor and the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground anymore for man's sake for the imagination or the opinion of man's heart is evil from his youth. You don't have to be a grown man to be evil. N-A-H, N-A-U-W-R, N-A-U-W-R, and R. It's evil... Oh, excuse me, that's the word youth. He's evil, he is, he is raw. Same word as the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Man's basic nature is evil as a child. When you come to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and you find out what good and what evil is, and you find out what sin is, every man goes straight to sin. Neither will I smite any more everything living as I have done. Well, he's not going to smite with the flood as he has done, but he's going to smite with fire in the end. Now, look over here in Deuteronomy 29. Deuteronomy 29. In Deuteronomy, God is, re is telling Israel what's going to happen to them when they get in the promised land. Deuteronomy is at the end of the book of the law. When, God, when they go through Genesis, Exodus, 
Leviticus. Exodus is the exiting, when they exit Egypt, there in Exodus, the 12th chapter, they're leaving Egypt. The 14th chapter, they cross the Red Sea and Pharaoh's armies are drowned. Leviticus is the law of the Levites, the priesthood. Numbers is their journey in the wilderness. When you leave, uh, when, you leave when they leave Sinai, and they start, and they go up here to Kadesh Barnea, and they're in the wilderness when they leave Sinai. They're in Sinai for 40 years, and all the time they're in the wilderness is the book of Numbers. Numbers. And right before they cross the river to take possession of the land of Canaan, and later on it'll become Israel, right before is the time period of Deuteronomy. So when we're in Deuteronomy here, 29, they're just about to cross the river, and God's given, Deuteronomy means second law. It comes from duo and nomos. Nomos is the Greek word law. Duo means two. A duet is two people. Duo is two people. So Deuteronomy means second law. Why a second law? Because it takes two witnesses to establish anything with God in the world. That's Jewish law. Over there in Numbers and Deuteronomy and Leviticus takes two witnesses. So God's given us two witnesses and the second witness is the book of Deuteronomy. So when you go into Deuteronomy 29, look here in 29, and he's warning Israel what's going to happen when they get into the land and he's talking to them. Uh, let's back up a little. And let's see here. Let's go to verse 17. And ye have seen the abominations of these pagans with their idols, and their idols, and wood, and stone, and silver, and gold, which were among them, lest there should be among you man or woman or family or tribe whose heart turneth away this day from their Lord our God to go and serve the gods of these nations, lest there should be among you a root that beareth gall and wormwood. So what happens when you get in your, involved in your imagination, you turn away from God, you get very bitter and angry in life. I've said this so many times before. Bitterness and gall, gall and bitterness has to do it has to do with becoming bitter in life. When, you, when God's Israel, the ones He's loved, turns away from the law that He's written in their hearts, here's what happens. And it come to pass, when He heareth the words of the curse, that He bless Himself in His heart, saying, I shall have peace even though I've turned away from God. Though I walk in the imagination of my heart. Now, when a man walks in imagination, what he's doing, he's turned away from God's law that God has written in his heart. And that's the word sheruth. Here's what happens when you have been into truth. Here's what happens to you. You turn away from God. You get bitter. You get angry. And you get involved in your opinion or your imagination. Here's the word. S-H-E-R-I. This is the word imagination here. R-U-W-T-H. Sheruth. It means a sense of being firmly twisted. To be twisted and obstinate in that twisting of God's word. Obstinate means hard-headed. You're hard-headed. I've got me an opinion. I don't think nothing's wrong with Christmas, and I don't think nothing's wrong with Easter. I think I can celebrate my birthday. I don't think I've got a free will to do whatever I want to do. You're a thickhead. you got a head like concrete out here, like that asphalt out in the parking lot. You can, when you turn away from God, that's what he's saying. When you turn away, it means imagination. When a man is hard-headed, why is he hard-headed? He's wanting his way. 
He's got an opinion. Man's opinion is hard head. That's man's opinion. It's a hard head. It's, a, it's stubborn. It's belligerent. I'll have my way or I'll die. Well, you'll die. You can't have your way. Not with God. You can think you're walking a certain way. I'm going to do this. I don't care. And God says, get over here. And what he's going to do is manipulate your life with a car wreck, with losing your job, losing your house, losing your health. And then he's going to say when you're about 45 or 50, do I have your attention? You're going to say, yes, sir, please, God, don't hit me again. You're going to feel like Kool-Aid and Luke, you know. Don't hit me. I got my mind right, Lord. God did that to me. I know what he'll do to us. Has he done that to anybody besides me? Boy, it's a tough way to go, isn't it? And he's still doing it to some of you that raised your hand, isn't he? And the other of you, those that didn't raise your hand, God's going to get you for lying. Okay. <laughs> How much time do I have, Mike? Eight. Eight minutes. Let me give you another couple of these. Man's opinion is imagination, and it began at Babylon, didn't it? It's let me make me a name, myself an opinion. I don't like God's prophet Shem. I don't like God's Jesus. I want me another Jesus. One that lets me do what I want to do in the nice church down the street. That's in 2 Corinthians 11 chapter where Paul says there's another Jesus, another spirit, another gospel. And I didn't preach that one. And I'm afraid you'll follow that one because he's easy, Jesus. You don't require nothing. Look here in... Deuteronomy 31. So when man gets involved in his imagination, that's self, that's opinion, and God says, I predestine you to conform to Christ and get uninvolved in your opinion. Deuteronomy 29. Um, excuse me, 31. 31 verse 21. Now, all of Deuteronomy, God is warning Israel what he's going to do to them when they get into the land. He doesn't say, if you get involved in yourself in the 28th chapter. He says, when you get into the land, you're going to turn away from me. You are going to go after idol gods, and then I'm going to scatter you upon the face of the earth. Read the whole chapter of the 28th chapter of Deuteronomy. He says, this is what you're going to do when you get into the land. Not if you do it, you're going to do it. I wonder how he knew that. Maybe he'd arranged it, right? Did Israel stumble just merely to stumble? No, they stumbled so salvation would come to the Gentiles in the New Testament church. If God caused, if Israel stumbled so salvation would come to the Gentile church who were preordained before the foundation of the world, then God had to preordain the stumbling of Israel going after these idols, Baal in the grove, which was Christmas. God caused Israel to go after Christmas, didn't he? And then he said, I'm going to punish you for it. That's a hard thing to get a hold of. I'm going to cause Babylon to come in because of your idolatry. I'm going to cause them to carry you away into captivity. And after I get through having them carry you away into captivity, I'm going to look at Babylon and say, Aha, caught you messing with my people. I'm going to destroy you for this. But God picked them up and whipped Israel with them. Don't try to figure it out. You believe it because God said it, right? That's why you believe it. So he says in 3121. Is that what I said? 31. 31, 21. It shall come to pass when many evils and troubles are befallen Israel that this song of Moses, and the song of Moses is chapter 32. And they sang this song about their trials in the wilderness. Shall testify against Israel as a witness. Remember, when they testified, they had to have two or three witnesses, right? For it shall be forgotten out of the mouths of their seed. It's going to be their children's children's children are going to forget what they did to me. And I'm going to have to bring judgment upon their great uh, the generation that comes after him but i know their imagination which they go about 
even now before I have brought them into the land. While they're waiting to cross the river, I know their imagination before I bring them in. That's why I pronounced on them, you will go into the land, you will get involved in opinion, you'll go after these other gods, and then I'll have you carried away into captivity all over the world, and you'll be so hard-headed and so obstinate that I'll call my people by another name, Gentile Church, Spiritual Israel. He said, I know about it ahead of time. How does he know about it? He's planned it all. He works all things after the counsel of his own will, doesn't he? In everything give thanks. This is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. What verse? Yeah, he says, Before I brought you in the land, Moses therefore wrote this song the same day and taught it to the children of Israel. If you have a King, if you have a Thompson Chain Bible, right after it says chapter 32, the next chapter it says, Moses' song which sets forth the perfections of God. The song of Moses is what's going to perfect the people of God. And if you've ever heard of the song of Moses, it's here in chapter 32, verse 1. Give ear, O heavens, and I will speak and hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. My doctrine shall drop as the rain. My instructions will drop upon my people as the rain. My speech shall distill as the dew, as the small rain upon the tender herb, and as the showers upon the grass, because I will publish the name of the Lord, and I'll get rid of your name. Ascribe ye greatness unto our God. He is the rock out of which the water will come in the wilderness. His work is perfect. Everything he does is perfect, and he does everything, doesn't he? For all his ways are judgment and God of truth, and without iniquity, God doesn't have any iniquity. Just and right is God. When he ordains men for destruction, he is just. People say, I want fairness. No, you don't. It's fair that God sends everybody to hell. You want grace, charis, unmerited favor. God picked out his Israel before the world began, didn't he? That's his family. That's the one whom he loved, he scourges and chastens. For God so loved. Jacob, have I loved. They're all the same word. He's given his commandment to us, and he insists on it. We walk in it. If you're a believer, I believe most of the people here are, don't be surprised. God's not through with you yet. I don't care if you are 70 is Dwayne. He ain't through with you. He ain't through beating you. <laughs> you think God quits beating us one day? Oh, you're old and I feel sorry for you, so I won't beat you anymore. Yes, he will. Where'd you come up with? Where do people come up with this imaginary stuff? It's Babylon in them, isn't it? Am I out of time, Mike? I've got so much more of this. I'm going to come back to this imagination next Sunday morning. Men are involved in opinion. That's, they've imagined it. Isn't it amazing you can tell somebody, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be... Well, that's your opinion. What are you talking about, though, that's my opinion? You, you're saying that's my opinion is your opinion. It's imagination. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the truth. Help us to realize that we are your children. We have to obey you whether we like it or not. And you'll teach us to like it and love it. Lord, I thank you for that. Cause us to continue this work. Lead us to your elect and open up many doors for the ministry. We'll praise you and glorify you for all things. Lead us to your elect family. In Christ's name, amen. I think that's as clear as predestination can be made. Hey, what are you doing? How's it going? Oh, pretty good. That's yeah. about as clear as I can make it. It's the 15th today. Can I get those cards? Uh, yeah, I've got to get them. That's good. How about I forgot to tonight bring tonight them. After the tonight after the message okay. be good. Okay. You. Okay. Love you, man.
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>